this morning there's a old gospel song that um, Dale McCurdy first recorded, I believe. Uh, it's called Help is on the Way, and it was on my mind this morning as I was thinking about so many different ones that are in some long-term situations, and uh, just an encouraging song written from uh, the story of Elijah and the, and the uh, widow, uh, how, how God is always faithful to bring what we need when we need it, just on time and his timing. So it's not exactly a hymn or a chorus, um, but there's a message in the song. story. Hold on a little longer. Help is on the way. Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. God is growing us in our faith and our trust in him. That's um, what he always does during difficult circumstances. And I just love that old tune. Uh, so this morning we're picking up in John chapter 8 and we'll complete John chapter 8. And we're still in this discourse, this dialogue that Jesus is having with the Jews, most likely the Pharisees there on the Temple Mount during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they respond to Jesus um, after he said in verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason that you do not hear is that you are not of God. And Jesus had not just accused them, but he had brought to light that God was not their father, that they were of the devil. Yeah, the devil was their father. And so he makes a statement, if, if you knew the father, you would, you would hear his words, you would hear the words of God. And that's a key component to hearing the words of God, to understanding what God says. Paul writes uh, in um, Corinthians that the natural man or the unsaved man 
does not understand the things of God, doesn't understand, understand the word of God because God's word is spiritually discerned. And it's not until one is born again, born of the spirit of God and the spirit of God indwells the heart of that one once they place their faith and trust in Christ that they begin to understand the word of God. There's a marked difference that I find in many people's testimonies when uh, they speak of when they came to know Christ. And this is the same testimony that I know I have and, and my wife has, is that all of a sudden the Word of God opened up to us. All of a sudden we had a desire to hear from God. We had a desire to know God, to know God through His Word. And I would contend that that is a mark of of continuing to walk in the Spirit of God, that when we are walking in the Spirit of God, when we're yielding to the Holy Spirit, that there seems to be an insatiable desire to be in the Word of God, to hear from God on a regular basis. And I know if you're like me, all of us struggle at times in our quiet time and our times in the Word, and sometimes it just doesn't sink. Uh, that's kind of natural in the Christian life, and so don't get alarmed if that happens. But generally, in a person's life who's been born again, they're going to have a desire for the Word of God. They're going to have a desire, and the Word of God is going to resonate in their heart. It's hard to explain what I mean by that, but I think what I mean is that there's a response to the Word of God as we read it and meditate on the Word. And so in response to Jesus' statement, they tell him in verse 48 uh, that they answered him, and said, are we not right in saying that you are Samaritan and you have a demon? Now, this is not the only time that Jesus was going to be accused by those who were in opposition to him of having a demon. Uh, we find that a number of times in John's gospel, Mark's, every gospel uh, records times when they accused Jesus of having a demon and that his works were demonically inspired. And of course, uh, Jesus had responded at one time that uh, that that was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and every sin will be forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, there, there are a lot of interpretations in that statement of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is the unfor unpardonable or unforgivable sin? Well, quite simply, number one, I don't believe we can commit that sin that is recorded in Scripture uh, today because Jesus is not physically present. And so we have to take it in context of, of what was happening. And so the Jews were accusing Jesus, actually accusing the Holy Spirit of being demonic. And uh, that was in the presence of Jesus. But number two, if we take the whole of Scripture, the only sin that is unforgivable is not trusting Christ for our salvation. And so once one has trusted Christ for their salvation, they are saved unto the very end. There is nothing then that can ever separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, because God is the one that does the regenerating. God is the one that saves us, and that's only a work that God can do, and nothing we can do can undo that, or nothing that anyone else can do can undo that. Primary passage for that is Romans chapter 8. And so here they accused him of being a Samaritan and of the devil. Well, they didn't think he was a Samaritan, but they were using that as a derogatory term because the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were considered to be of lower class, lower everything. And the Jews, it was a slanderous comment to accuse him of being a Samaritan. It may be akin to using a an ethnic derogatory uh, term today. Um, I was watching a mob movie not too long ago, and and the term WAP was used a lot, and that was a derogatory term. Just like today, um, the, the, I, I, I'm a, I'm, I don't even want to say the word, but you know what I'm thinking. So it was, it was a very cutting um, statement to make to Jesus, a derogatory comment. And so Jesus answered them, I do not have a demon, but I honor my, my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. And so here Jesus is making himself, declaring himself to be the Son of God when he speaks of his Father. 
there's a distinction here in a pronoun that's going to be used. He, he speaks of my father. Later, he's going to speak of your father. And so um, he's drawing a distinction that, that he is the son of God. And he says, he does not seek his own glory in verse 50. Uh, and here again, we see that in the life of Jesus, Jesus' motivation for coming to earth uh, yes, he was motivated by love to to save lost sinners, but his ultimate motivation was to be submissive to the will of the Father. Just like that should be our ultimate motivation in our life, that our desire should be sub, to be uh, would be that we would be submissive to the Father and obedient to the words of God. And so Jesus was making the statement, "I don't seek my own glory. If if I saw my own glory." Um, it would be nothing, uh, but there's one who judges, and he's the one that I'm seeking his glory. Truly, truly, verse 51, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. I think primarily Jesus was speaking of his declaration of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's what he proclaimed. And if anyone keeps that, if anyone trusts that and accepts it, holds on to it, he will never see death. Now, Jesus is not talking of physical death because we all know that we'll physically die. He's speaking of, e of eternal death. He's speaking of that death that was to come and is to come, that second death that's spoken of in the book of Revelation, where uh, once that judgment takes place, that those who have not trusted Christ will be separated from God for eternity in hell. And so the promise is given here that if, if we accept his word, if we hold to his word, then we'll never see death. That's eternal life with him. Underline the word never. That person will never see death. And so we're saved for all of eternity. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And so here the Jews are going back to those two things that they revered, Abraham, who is the father of the Jews, and prophets. Primarily, they're speaking of the prophet Moses. Uh, they held Moses and Abraham were two of the most iconic figures in, in their heritage. And they are making the statement, listen, they, they believe God. Um, and, and yet Abraham did die and so did Moses. And so they're, they're not getting what Jesus said, but Jesus said, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. He repeats it again in verse 53. They say, are you greater than our father, Abraham, who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Good question. Who are you, Jesus? See, that's a question that every person has to make when they're confronted with the person of Jesus. Who are you, Jesus? Uh, who was he? And when a person begins to ask those kinds of questions is a great indication that perhaps the Father is drawing them. And God wants to use you and he wants to use me to answer who this Jesus is. The best way to answer that is to share our personal story and our testimony with them of how we recognize Jesus as being the Savior of the world, the one who paid the penalty for our sins, and we trusted him. And all we know is that our life was transformed as we came to know Christ. And so that's the best way to answer that question to others. And uh, Jesus answered them, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. So he's, he's saying, listen, my self-glorification is nothing. And that's a reminder to us that, that we, if we try to glorify ourselves or if we do anything out of a motive of self-glorification to get the glory before man, it's nothing. We've just lost our reward. But it's the Father who glorifies. The Father puts a stamp of approval. The Father blesses that which we do in his name with the right motive. Um, uh, it is my Father who glorifies me, he says, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. 
he saw it and was glad. Now here Jesus again is saying to them, listen, you don't know my father. And the Jews claim to know God. But he's saying, you, you really don't know him. Um, if you did, you would obey my word and you would rejoice in seeing my coming, making reference to him as being the Messiah. And then he says, Abraham looked forward to my coming. He saw my coming and he rejoiced. And to this, they respond, you are not yet 50 years old and you say that you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Now, in a practical sense, they were right. Jesus in his earthly age was not old enough to have seen Abraham. He was hundreds of years before Jesus. But Jesus is making the declaration here that he has seen Abraham. And the reason he can say that he's seen Abraham, because he is God. You ask JMO, where does he say that he's God here? By using that personal pronoun of God, Yahweh, before Abraham was I am. Same pronoun that was used when uh, Moses approached the burning bush. Um, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And God says to Moses, go to Pharaoh. And he says, whom shall I say sent me? And God uses that personal pronoun, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, to declare who he was. And translated in English, that is, I am. And so Jesus was using that very phrase. You see, the Jews would never use that phrase of themselves. That was considered to be blasphemy against God. But here Jesus makes the declaration that he is God. This is only one reference in Scripture that points to the fact that Jesus claimed and is God Almighty. And uh, one of the hallmarks of every cult is that they deny that Jesus was God. I think quickly of the Mormons, I think quickly of those of Jehovah's Witness, um, the Way International, all of these other cults claim that Jesus was not God. But Jesus emphatically declared himself, and it bears witness through Scripture, that Jesus is God. And to that, verse 59, they picked up stones to stone him. They literally wanted to kill Jesus. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Well, I pray you'll meditate today on who Jesus is and his, the glory of him saving us and our worship and adoration all belongs to him. I pray that God would give us an opportunity today to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart and we would recognize a seed has been planted that we would be intentional to try to cultivate that seed uh, so that we might be able to share in God's grace of witnessing him save somebody. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I, I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning, Lord willing, if nothing comes up. Uh, that happened last Thursday, and so my apologies. Uh, but mark it on your calendar, October the 28th, 7 to 9 a.m., to be here to love on first responders in our community. I love you. Lord bless you, and have a great day.